And now, the survival show that once survived a nasty electric shock on the ear by its brother. In this episode, we sit down with one of the very few people in the world with the chops to talk about EMPs. He'll give us the facts and destroy the myths. Howdy and welcome to the Rabbit Holes Urban Survival Podcast. This is episode number 251. I'm your host, Aaron, and you are in the rabbit hole. Safe and sound. Some quick announcements before we bring on today's guest. First, ITRH is getting rid of Facebook, period. There are two reasons for this. For some time now, increasingly, our MODA members started asking for something more private and just a different solution that wasn't Facebook. One member even told me directly she was only keeping her Facebook account active because she loved the private group so much. So we set up a workspace using the Slack app and moved everyone a few days ago. So why kill the public Facebook page? There are a lot of moving parts to this. Chief among the reasons, Facebook is selling your data, like crazy amounts of it. And the data collected is so Orwellian, I just can't take it anymore. There's a lot in the news about this right now, and there's a pretty big viral hashtag delete Facebook groundswell. Not really all about that. All I'm worried about really is myself and y'all. I'm not really worried about any of the larger movements or anything like that. The next reason, and this kind of goes back to our no column and the no list. Facebook doesn't do anything for ITRH except suck up time and money. On a good day, a post on the page reaches half of the people connected, unless I pay Facebook to boost the post. So ITRH does a whole lot of work to attract you to the page, tries to build a community. You voluntarily say you want to connect, and Facebook says to me, pay up. I'm all for paying for an advertising platform to reach new people, but paying for access to people I'm already connected to just burns me up as a business owner, and even as a marketing and advertising person in my day job. It's their business. They can do whatever they want, and you can do whatever you want. I'm just done with it, and the ROI for the bunny just doesn't add up. In the rabbit hole, we'll be spending its social media energy on Twitter. You can connect via at ITRH Survival. We'll also be putting a lot more energy into YouTube soon. I know. Hold on. This may seem counterintuitive to a lot of you because of the recent gun dust up, but I think it's going to be a very smart move for ITRH. We'll discuss this in more detail in a few weeks. I have flapped my lips about this enough. One last thing. This episode is technical. I mean, there's just no way around it. We'll do our best to make it approachable, but some things just are what they are. With that, let's discuss EMPs. An episode dedicated to EMPs is one of the most requested topics on ITRH, but I've held off on doing this for years because I wanted someone who I believed had the credentials and background to speak about the topic intelligently and accurately. That required a very special person with who understood both the physics and the math and also understood preppers. So it's a lot of it's a very special combination. And after years of waiting, here we are. Dr. Bradley, welcome back in the rabbit hole. Thank you very much. Let's start with the obvious question before we really get into things. You know, I've done that big lead up here. But can you tell us what are your qualifications we're speaking on this topic, uh, the, the topic of EMPs and CMEs and all this other fun stuff we're going to get into today. Sure. Yeah. And it's a good question because, as you know, if you search the web, everybody's got lots of facts and data and opinions about uh, EMP attacks and their effects. And so it's a good idea to find out who knows what they're talking about and who doesn't. And there's a few that do and a whole bunch that don't. <laughs> uh, my background is uh, I have a PhD in electrical engineering. So I've been around electronics and electricity and engineering for about 30 years or so. Mm. Um, I'm a certified EMI, EMC engineer, which just means 
that I went and took an eight-hour exam on electromagnetic interference and electromagnetic compatibility. And those have a lot to do with RF energy and shielding and protection, um, which folds directly into an EMP when you're talking about things like Faraday cages and field levels and things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm also a licensed professional engineer, which is one of the few things most people actually can't call themselves engineers unless you're a licensed professional engineer. You can't actually say you're an engineer. Yeah, it's like architecture. Um, But anyway, I I can officially say I'm an engineer. That's a great thing. (laughs) And then uh, finally, I work, uh, my day job is at NASA, which um, uh, one of the core things I've done for NASA, probably my biggest contribution actually, has been helping to resolve difficult electromagnetic problems that they've had with systems. And so I've had a lot of hands-on experience with that. And I would imagine that's a pretty big topic for them because a lot of the, I mean, a tremendous amount of what y'all do is very sensitive instruments uh, that are up above all the protections that the Earth's atmosphere gives us from electromagnetic uh, stuff. So that... uh, Yeah, you're right. Yeah, Yeah, you're exactly right. We have, I would say, almost every single project we ever work on, at some point, this, the, not the topic of EMP, but the topic of electromagnetic interference, you know, raises its ugly head and somebody has to come in and try and troubleshoot it and solve that problem. So it's, it's a very common problem and there's a shortage of sort of experts that understand the field. Mm-hmm. You know, I think as a prepper, EM, for me at least, EMPs are such a big, hairy, low frequency, high destruction event. I've long since put them in what I call the no column or the another way to think about it would be the too big to worry about category. Like I'm just going to wind myself around an axle and not really get what I think is productive forward movement in preparedness. The, one of the things I run into and, and one of the problems as we talked about a second ago was that there is so much bad information and so much conflicting information. So let's let's start here at the very very high level. Are EMPs a real threat, or is it prepper fiction fantasy? Yeah, that's a great place to start. Um, in fact, I start all of my preparations that way. Basically, I, I ask the question: Is this worth my time? Mm-hmm. Right, my time, my energy, my money. Um, and everybody has to sort of answer those questions on each thing they prepare for by themselves. But the EMP has been understood at least since the 1940s. Um, some of the early uh, nuclear weapons tests demonstrated that when you detonated a, an atomic or nuclear bomb, you could create a very large electromagnetic pulse. Initially, it was unintentional, but they they measured it. And they called it radio flash. Hmm. Um, later on, they started realizing, hey, this very powerful electromagnetic pulse might be of value to us. Maybe we could use it as part of a weapon. And so there were tests done in the 60s and 70s um, by the U.S. and Russia um, over the Pacific Ocean, where they detonated nuclear warheads uh, in the atmosphere, and they were able to, many hundreds of miles away, see damage, uh, electrical damage, due to these electromagnetic pulses. And so it became fairly well understood back in those six, in the 1960s that yes, indeed, this is a viable weapon. Uh, and there's lots of advantages, and there's some disadvantages to it. The obvious advantage is that you can you can cause a, a great deal of destruction to infrastructure without actually killing anyone directly. And so it makes it difficult for a country to make a case for a full-scale military retaliation, especially a nuclear retaliation, for something that didn't necessarily immediately kill a large population, but just instead you know, maybe destroyed some key infrastructures in the nation. Um, and so it has this attractiveness to it as sort of a, an asymmetric attack is what it's usually called. Uh, and even very small countries view it as a method by which they could strike you know, a very powerful country and inflict great financial hardship on them. The the phenomena is certainly real. Um, you know, our government had an EMP commission to look at this, that some of the world's experts came together and concluded, yeah, this is a very real threat. And there's lots of things that countries should do to be prepared for this, to get better prepared. They presented that to Congress and, and on, on up and a couple of different times. As far as I know, Congress listened, took notes, and nothing really ever came of it. Certainly, our commercial infrastructures were never really hardened against it. Whether or not the military infrastructures were, I don't know. Um, but so it's a real viable threat. Um, it's not the only threat we face, but it certainly is a viable one. It's one that's been threatened by Russia. We, we, Russia's overtly threatened to use it against us, as has North Korea. Um, and so it's certainly something our enemies understand as well. 
So, and I think, and to go back in a little bit of history, what, because I know there was the Russians big, their big test was in Kazakhstan. And then we had, I think it was, uh, I think it was referred to as Starfish Prime. What are some of the things that, that we, like in the early days, learned about that, that, that just how destructive it can be or how far reaching it can be? You know, there's still some of that that is, that is just sort of projection because you, you mentioned the, the Russian test. And that's, you're exactly right. They tested over Kazakhstan. Um, and that was back, I think that was back maybe in the late, you know, middle 60s, I think, maybe 1962 or 63. And they took a very modest-sized warhead, uh, like a 300-kiloton warhead, which is nothing by today's standards. And they detonated it uh, over a populated area, um, Kazakhstan. And they, they wanted to see what would a modest weapon detonated like that, would it have any effect down at the ground? In fact, it did. It had a pretty significant effect. It caused some fires, took out a large power plant. But again, it was a fairly modest test, and it wasn't optimized. The bomb wasn't optimized to generate a really powerful EMP. Um, they didn't. T- By the way, they didn't tell the population that they were doing it. Well, they no. just decided they would test it, you know, on the fly. <laughs> yeah. Um, but anyhow, so that very modest test gave them some level of understanding of what you know kinds of damage they might see. Now the weapons have grown much more powerful and they much more they can create much more powerful uh, electromagnetic energy than they used to. Um so even something smaller than a 300 kiloton warhead if properly designed is believed to be able to cause ex- very extensive damage down on the ground. And it's usually measured in terms of what the field levels are, um typically measured in volts per meter, so what the electric field is measured in. And depending on who you talk to and which report you believe, um, the guesses are something like between 50 and a hundred thousand volts per meter could be seen at the ground. Um, and there's a pattern to it and, and so forth and so on, but it could be, it could cover some very high level fields could cover the entire continental United States with just one or two detonations. And so you could, with those kind of field levels, anything over about 10,000 volts per meter can start damaging all kinds of electronics. You could take out lots and lots of electronics all across the United States. The most important, which would be our electrical grid. And I, and probably the most susceptible for a few reasons, which we can get into in a bit. But you know, you you mentioned something interesting there, and I want to kind of dig it out. Which is, I've heard that nuclear bombs can be configured or optimized specifically for the EMP generation. Can you talk about that just a little bit? Well, very little. I don't have the the design knowledge of the bomb structures and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. You know, the idea is that a nuclear warhead detonates, it generates these gamma rays, high energy gamma rays. They ultimately cause ionization, which is basically another fancy term for stripping electrons off of associated atoms. And then you get this avalanche-like effect where these, these electrons knock maybe two off as they flow forward, and then those two knock off six more, and, and you get this avalanching effect of a lot of charge carriers moving. Of course, our Earth has magnetic field lines surrounding it, and as these electrons um, approach the magnetic field lines, they perturbate them and start to spiral around them. And by perturbating those electro, uh, those magnetic field lines, you can get uh, a very large ground currents introduced at the surface of the earth, as well as these, um, these electromagnetic waves flowing in from above. Those two types of things couple in systems differently. Um, but long conductors like, um, uh, like the power grid, for example, or buried, uh, pipelines and things like that can take a huge amount of energy in because they're so long, they can couple in these very low frequency waves and, and generate very, very large currents that can then damage transformers or blow out controllers or those kinds of things. And then the higher frequency energies that flow through the air typically couple into smaller scale electronics like cars and airplanes and phones and, and those kinds of things, also potentially causing extensive damage. Now, EMPs aren't just man-made. I mean, we also have uh, electro- massive electromagnetic interference by uh, some natural things. So can you talk a little bit about where EMPs and CMEs or coronal mass ejections overlap and where they differ? Sure. Yeah. So as you said, there, an EMP is a, is a term that we've coined. Um, it's often used to describe a high altitude nuclear uh, electromagnetic pulse that results from a nuclear bomb, right? Nuclear explosion. But in reality, it's just describing any kind of electromagnetic pulse energy And so, for example, lightning generates an electromagnetic pulse. Now, lightning is a breakdown phenomenon. It's not by itself inherently a pulse, an electromagnetic pulse. You know, it's a breakdown of of a flow of charge carriers. But 
by, by doing so, it generates a pulse, which is felt far away from it. And that's why often you hear your radio pop and things like that, because that electromagnetic energy couples into your system and causes it to be disturbed. And so there are other types of electromagnetic pulses that we experience. And as you mentioned, uh, the sun will certainly generate electromagnetic pulse energy as well. And there's a couple different kinds, um, well, there's several different kinds, but the two often talked about are solar flares and these coronal mass ejections. And they're different. Um, they themselves are different, and they're very different than a high altitude nuclear EMP. I'll see if I can kind of just sum up the differences. Um, for one thing, solar flares typically travel at about the speed of light. Um, so you don't detect the solar flare ahead of time and warn the Earth because you're not going to radio any faster than the pulse is already traveling. Hmm. And so by the time you know it's occurred, it's already at you. Um, the good news is the solar flare doesn't cause these kind of things that we're talking about, which is destroying the power grid and things like that. They typically cause interference with RF communication. They might cause damage to satellites and things like that, radiation hazards to astronauts, th things like that. You don't really get warning of those. When they're there, they're there. Um, coronal mass ejections are much slower flowing through space, relatively speaking. And so they're like big waves of plasma, if you will, that flow through, through space. And plasma is just a charged particles really that flow through space and you typically can get some warning on those we have satellites watching the sun all day long every day and they get they detect these coronal mass ejections early maybe a day maybe two maybe three days before they hit the earth and so in theory those coronal mass ejections we could warn the earth in time and say hey there's a big wave of cme coming your way and you should do something about it to prepare um, we do monitor them now you can go on lots of websites and You'll know when the CMEs are occurring and when they're going to hit the Earth. Um, but to date, I'm not aware of any time that the U.S. has ever done anything like really preparatory, like shut down the power grid in preparation for it or something like that. Hmm. But I do want to make a difference. There's, there's a difference in the rates in which those arrive. Now, the difference that most people get confused about is the CMEs versus an EMP, and that, that being a nuclear EMP. Um, they have very similar things and they have some different things. Um, the similarity between them is that both are very, you know, high amounts of energy that are impinged upon the surface of the earth, and both can take out very large uh, infrastructures like the power grid. Um, so in that sense, they have that same threat. And it is the biggest threat is the power grid being taken out and damaged in a long, for a long term. So both of them pose that same threat. A CME or an EMP can both do that. Um, and that's sort of the big extent of the CME. As far as we on the ground are concerned, yes, it interferes with radio waves, and yes, it can harm astronauts and all that kind of stuff. But for an EMP, you know, it's very different. A true nuclear EMP doesn't only disturb the power grid; it also potentially damages all commercial, maybe a lot of military electronics as well. And that's something very different than the events that occur from the sun. So, you know, an EMP might damage my car. A coronal mass ejection will not damage my car. Um, I might need to store things and protect these small electronics from an EMP. I don't need to do that from a coronal mass ejection because they're very different kinds of threats when it comes to small electronics. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense to you? That makes sense. That makes sense. And yeah. so, okay, so an EMP is, I guess, to to sum it up, so an EMP is a much more broadband effect than than maybe a CME. Is yeah, that's exactly right. Um, and and that term broadband I use a lot, and and it's kind of a technical jargon term, but if you take any kind of electromagnetic wave, you can measure the wavelength of it. Now, a pulse is actually a collection of a whole bunch of different wavelength things added together. Um, but an EMP is so narrow in time, and then it sort of spreads out at the tail end. It has frequency, it has energy in very low frequencies and very high frequencies. And so it's very broadband in terms of where its energy is stored. And the low frequency stuff couples very well into large things like the power grid mm. and the high frequency energy couples very well into small things like let's say your cell phone or your car. And so that the EMP has the potential to damage a wide array of stuff. Whereas the sun CME really is just a low frequency event. It really, it's energy is in low frequency content. So it needs bigger, longer runs of wire and, and lengths of metal in general. Correct. Exactly I right. Gotcha. Okay. So to to move on to a little bit as an EMP as a threat or somebody using it as a weapon so that people can understand a little bit more background, what are the conditions that really need at a very high level, what are the conditions needed 
or say, let's go out on a limb and say, North Korea decides we're going to, you know, we're going to really mess with the U.S. and a a, a nuclear using the, the strategy of a, a a full on nuclear assault like maybe Russia would do, isn't in their cards. They don't have enough bombs for it. They don't have the the ICBM technology for it. Whatever, and they say, really, what we want to do is just really cause them a lot of problems. So they go the EMP route. What what do they actually have to do? Like, what are those conditions to actually make an EMP, uh, a man made EMP, uh, useful for them and not just a minor irritant? Right. Okay. So there's there's really a couple of things um, that they would require. They'll need a, a nuclear warhead capable of causing that generating that electromagnetic pulse. Um, they recently dem- demonstrated, I believe it was a 120 kiloton weapon which is right on the edge of, of perhaps, especially if it were fine-tuned to generate this electromagnetic energy, of being able to cause these really you know, detrimental effects at the ground. So I think if they're not there now, they're very close in terms of the, of the yield they would need of their weapon. The other thing they need is they need some kind of delivery system. And you have to be able to put the warhead high enough, um, up really above 25 miles in the atmosphere. And to do that, no, North Korea can do that. They can put their weapons up pretty darn high. They can't necessarily bring them down where they want yet. <laughs> at least we don't think so. Mm-hmm. But they can put them up, right? They've put up satellites before. So they can put it up high enough. Um, and so those are the two conditions. You've got to have a nuclear warhead that's able to generate the energy, and you have to have a delivery system that can put it up in the general vicinity. All they'd have to do is, is launch the thing to be somewhere over the continental, middle continental United States, and that's close enough. You know, this is one of those horseshoes and hand grenades things. This is more like the hand grenades. You just need to be close enough where you want to be. Hmm. You're not trying to hit a city. You're just trying to get over, let's say, the state of Kansas. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think they possess that ability. Now, whether or not we, w- we would be able to intercept and destroy that missile, I don't know. I don't think anybody really, you know, outside of the military circle knows our abilities to intercept uh, a warhead like that. But I wouldn't bet on it. I'll mm-hmm. just say that. That's some pretty accurate fast shooting on their part. Yeah. And there's a lot of technologies out. I mean, I'm versed in some from lasers to Mm -hmm. intercept missiles and so forth. It's just, you know, I don't think any of those have been so carefully studied and proven that we're like, Oh, I'm a 99%. I can intercept. I, you know, I think it's just, I'm just guessing as an educated person out here, maybe it's more like a 30 to 40% kind of number. Mm. And so it's not, I don't believe it's any kind of a sure thing that we're going to intercept an incoming ballistic missile. Mm Mm-hmm. We're going to take a quick break for this message. Listener, do you get at least $3 a month worth of value out of ITRH? You should see what we do for the ITRH Roving Horde Armada members. Check it out today by visiting ITRH.net. Members receive access to the private ITRH Armada Slack app group where they get to connect, get questions answered, share alerts and news, and shenanigans. Twice a month, members get on a private video chat. We discuss guns, mead, news, and other matters, and the things you just can't talk about with anyone else. In-person meetups in some areas. Access to every episode ever produced by ITRH, including one that was never aired. Big discounts to the ITRH gear store and participating vendors. And that's just to name a few things you get with your membership when you go to iterh.net and become part of the Roving Horde Armada. In the Rabbit Hole is mostly kept on the air and supported by members just like you. Go to iterh.net to find out more and become part of the iterh Roving Horde Armada. And hey, speaking of the gear store, In the Rabbit Hole is now selling survival gear on the site. You can get there by going to intherabbithole.com slash shop. But this isn't just a bunch of junk. I'm hand selecting and stocking the store with the best gear. And every month we're adding new products. Go to intherabbithole.com slash shop. Again, that's intherabbithole.com backslash shop. Now back to the episode. So let's go forward with the thought somehow you know north korea figures out um not that i necessarily think they would i'm just using them to beat up on them what um let's say they decide that's the strategy they're going with they they get the technology they figure it out they optimize their 
their warheads to produce as much of an EMP as possible. What starts to, let's get into the myths versus reality here. What starts to be the real impact? And I guess we could start with the first one, which is, you know, is there an immediate danger to people by an EMP? There is not. Yeah. So it's detonated, the weapons detonated high enough in the atmosphere. For most people would never even know that it occurred. Mm. If it happened at night, you might see the light you know, in the sky, but um, most of the time people wouldn't even know it occurred. There's a lot of misinformation about, well, it, it's so powerful, it damages all these electronics. So it must be, it would shock people. Or I've had people write me and say, you know, should, if my car, if my hand was resting on the hood of my car, would I be electrocuted? Or would it, would it melt my Faraday cage, right? It's just made out of aluminum foil. Why doesn't it melt my Faraday cage? And, and they're all good questions. And the short answer of it without going into the physics is the energy is so brief in time that you're not going to have any heating that you're going to be able to notice. And you're not going to have any electromagnetic effects on people or animals that you're going to be able to notice either. And so you won't know that it even happened. Nobody's going to suddenly drop dead, uh, assuming, you know, there are certain exceptions, like if you have a pacemaker that might have problems or something like that. But most people would never know it occurred because, you know, it's not viewed as being damaging to uh, living creatures. Mm -hmm. Okay. Not even, not even a little tingle? Not even a tingle. No, you wouldn't even know. So, you know, and you talked about putting it up 25 miles into the atmosphere, you know, and we, we can get into what does and doesn't an EMP actually destroy, but could... Could a bad act, because I know this has been in one of the many uh, books, and I think I've seen it in other stuff where an EMP is used in a in an airplane. Is that, you know, could somebody like North Korea says, well, this bomb thing's really difficult, but you know what we can do? We can fly an airplane over wherever, Kansas or Washington, D.C. It, would that actually be effective? Right. Yeah, I know that. In fact, I have a good friend who wrote a book where I think he had North Korea detonate one over somewhere in the continental U.S. in an in an airplane. And we talked about the, the limitation to that. But the reality of it is there's two problems with detonating a, a warhead like that from a, from an airplane. The first is that that electromagnetic waves are really a line of sight weapon, meaning that one, if you get too close to the ground, your line of sight you know, is, is only going to be so far before the waves have traveled down to the ground and you, your area of effect then is very small. Mm. Um, the higher up you go, the, the longer your line of sight, and the further that electromagnetic wave can be felt. And so if you're flying at, at typical distances of tens of thousands of feet, 30, 40, 50,000 feet, you're not going to get, you know, maybe 10, 15, 20 miles of an area down on the ground, maybe even a hundred miles or a few hundred miles of very weaker field. But at the end of the day, you're going to at best take out a part of a state. Um, in terms of its effect, right? And so that's not the, the really the national kind of crisis. Yeah, I mean, if you took out the city of Denver and you know suburbs in that area at, in terms of electric, electrical power generation, it would be very detrimental to them at the moment. But there'd be lots of infrastructure in the nation to come to their aid, mm -hmm. um, and we would we would mount up and keep going. And so that's the first issue: is the line of sight. You really don't, you really don't get by that. that. That's a fundamental limitation. And even if you took it on like a U-2, which flies at like 70,000 feet or something, you, you're really still then only getting a few hundred miles of coverage. And so I think from, a, from an airplane, just the line of sight kind of rules it out. Um, and the other thing is that there's an effect that occurs in a, there's a region of the atmosphere called the source region. And it's between about 12 and 25 miles. And uh, even the U-2s at 70,000 feet, it's only 13 miles. So it's just at the very bottom of the source region. Mm. And you really have to be above that to get all this avalanching of this. You know, I talked about the gamma rays and generating the electrons and all that. That, uh, that amplification of that wave really occurs in that source region. And so if you're below the source region, you know, the wave that's generated and felt at the Earth is much smaller anyway. Um, so even that city of Denver that we just talked about is likely to see much lower energy levels. Um, and so it's not likely that the damage would be that significant. And so between those two, I just don't think it's viable from an airplane at this point. So that also, cause I I've seen in some seen or read, it's, it's hard to remember. I ended up interacting so, with so much material, but where some bad actor has a, uh, an EMP bomb, uh, and however they're generating their EMP, but they have it at ground level and somehow it manages to take out a whole city. So that, I guess that is total nonsense. Yeah, I mean, there are some EMP weapons that are like EMP bombs that you drop and it generates a, an EMP in a very localized area or, you know, pulse types weapons. I've seen movies, right, where they have like it in the back of a van and they yeah, throw yeah. the switch and, boom, and it throws out an EMP. 
you can you can certainly develop an EMP that way, um, and it's not so different than the way they develop EMPs for testing. But it's the area of effect that's very small. Maybe you take out a a few blocks kind of thing. Mm-hmm. You're certainly not taking out a large scale city, and you're certainly not taking out a state or a country or something like that. So it's a you know if you were wanting to take out a military compound and it was critical that you took out the electronics, it might be a viable weapon. But I think for the kind of things we're worried about as individual preparers, I, I don't think it's something to worry about. I gotcha. I gotcha. So it's only good in like whatever the Ocean's 12 or 13 movie. Right. Perfect. To, yeah. yeah. Where, they're, where they're going after a very specific isolated target. That makes sense. Okay. So tinfoil, you know, is this something that's really good or is it really just left to headwear for blocking alien radio waves? <laughs> uh, well, it's good for both, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so the idea of using aluminum foil um, or or any kind of conductive material, really, to build an enclosure is a solid idea. I think it's a good idea. Um, the idea is that you put your most sensitive electronics inside of a, of a conductive enclosure, you seal it up really tight, and that conductive enclosure will somehow, magically, and we can talk about how, will reduce the, the, the fields that are outside of it to be very, very small inside of it. Mm-hmm. And in fact, that does work. We do that all the time um, for the work I do. It, most of the time, even your computers are, are done this way. They build them in metal housings for a reason, and it's to keep the electromagnetic energy actually from getting out of the box, hmm. or they won't pass the requirements of the government, but because they don't want it interfering with your phone and you know everything else in your room. Mm-hmm. So certainly, metal enclosures can block RF energy, no question about it. And they do that in various ways. Um, one thing that that gets people really confused is, well, there's a lot of things. One is how thick does the metal need to be? And I tell people it, a good way to think about it is a good thick layer of aluminum foil at the most, a couple layers of aluminum foil is thick enough. And it has to do with the, the frequency of the wave and the skin depth and all that kind of stuff. And unless you want to get into that physics, we'll just, you can just take my word for it. It's <laughs> along the orders of a, one or two layers of aluminum foil is adequate. Now, thicker is fine. You can have something, you know, like a, a galvanized aluminum garbage or, or steel garbage can. That's perfectly fine. It's nice and thick um, and it will do a fine job, but really no better. The thickness doesn't really start benefiting you too much more once you get past that, you know, that few layers of foil kind of number. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but you could have it made out of copper. You can have it made out of steel or aluminum. Really any kind of metal conductor would work fine. The key thing, if you're going to make an enclosure, and they like to call these Faraday cages, but the key thing is, is not so much the metal that you use or even the thickness that you use. It's the, the seams that you have that you create when you build it. So, for example, if you build a box, like you just take a cardboard box and you have a lid on it that you put on top and you wrap the lid with foil and you wrap the box with foil and you put them on top of each other, that seam that goes around where the lid met the box can leak RF energy pretty efficiently. And so what you find is that you have to really tape up those seams, those long, narrow seams with something conductive like, like aluminum duct tape from, from Lowe's or Home Depot or something and get it where it's really sealed up tight. And then it does a, a very good job of shielding. Hmm. Okay. Wow. That's, that's pretty interesting. You know, and I think this kind of takes us to what will and what won't stop, uh, just stop working after, after being exposed to an EMP. Well, let's start with everybody's favorite vehicles will an emp happen and everybody just boom their cars just stop working yeah i think that all started with um maybe one second after or or one of the emp books right and you know they're they're good reads i don't knock any of them and they they do get at least people thinking about how dependent we are on our our devices and technology and the short answer is it isn't believed that it would be anything quite that bad um most cars would likely survive the emp Many of them would have malfunctions. Uh, you know, you'd be driving along, and if an EMP went off, again, you wouldn't even know it happened. Your car would likely just experience some kind of anomaly. Maybe your dash would start going nuts. Maybe your car would shut off. You know, those type of things, I think, would affect many vehicles. It could be as much as maybe 70% of cars and trucks would experience some kind of anomaly because the fields would be very high. Mm. And that would cause all kinds of problems in its own right, right? You can imagine how many crashes would result from people's cars all of a sudden acting up on them. Mm. But Most of the cars, it is believed that if you manage to safely exit the road, shut the car off and restart the car, most of them would come back up and you could probably continue. Um, The numbers are hard to say because the testing has been very, very limited um, in terms of car susceptibility, automobile susceptibility, 
not well understood. And so people throw numbers around that the MP commission did some testing and they throw, they throw numbers like, well, the commission said only three to 5% of cars would be permanently damaged. And that is true, but the MP commission didn't test at full field levels to try and damage as many cars as they could. They, they weren't, they didn't want to be on the hook for all of the damaged cars. And so they were just, they were testing under very specific conditions and then drawing some conclusions. And so, like I said, that the exact numbers aren't known. What I tell people is there's a high likelihood if your car was operating at the time, some anomaly would happen. Some of them would be permanently damaged and some would not. If your car is shut off at the time, it's highly unlikely that your car would be damaged. You wouldn't know if it had an anomaly because it's unpowered and you wouldn't see it, but it's highly unlikely that it would be damaged. That's an interesting distinction that we should dig out. Is that true for electronics in general, that if they are shut off at the time um, of being exposed to an EMP, um, whether, because I know like in One Second After or any of these other books, like everything, cell phones, everything just stops working. Is So is that distinction that you made about it being shut off, is that also true? It is true to a slightly different degree. There's a couple of things coming in play. Cars, luckily, are cars are unique things, as are airplanes. They're built to withstand lots and lots of environments, right? Because we drive by high-power energy lines. We go by radio signals. We have all kinds of things. And we don't expect our car to have a hiccup whatsoever. And so there's a lot of shielding put in cars. Of course, most of them are made of metal, too. Mm-hmm. And so they are designed very robustly to start with, all right? As airplanes, even more so. They're very redundant systems. Mm-hmm. Um, but our personal electronics, you know, yes, it's true. We are exposed to various things, but they, you know, they're expected to last much shorter periods of time. If they get occasionally lock up here or there, oh, we just reboot them. You know, it's not a life, life and death kind of a thing. And so they're more susceptible in many ways than let's say a vehicle or an airplane would be. But with that said, um, it's certainly true. If an electronic device is unpowered in general, it would be less susceptible because if it's powered up, it's already has some resident energy in it, right? And if you perturbate that resident energy with a pulse, it's easier to exceed the max allowed levels on some of the components. Mm. And so as opposed to if it's sitting there and it's not powered at all, you have to generate all of the energy needed to exceed those component levels. And so it, it becomes more difficult to do if it's unpowered. Wow. Okay. That's really interesting. And I mean, that speaks to, that speaks to so many things because most of us like I know one of the big things that preppers tend to worry about is will my fancy uh, holographic or red dot optics or anything like that, you know, be fried in an EMP. And most of us don't just leave those things on all the time uh, as a, as a, for example. Yeah. That's an interesting one you brought up. Um, I asked that question. I have a, a, you know, red dot on my rifle, like a lot of people, and I don't take it off and put it in a Faraday cage because it's just too much trouble to re-zero it and all that, right. right? And so what I did is I actually did some testing and discovered that I can protect mine. Now, it is small. It is unpowered in general, although I leave batteries in it. So there's some energy powering some of the circuitry. Mm-hmm. But so what I did is very inexpensively, you can take conductive cloth and wrap it around the, the top. Basically, you, you circle around the rifle. I have a video of it on my website. But you can circle around the rifle and tie off that cloth and provide some very nice shielding to your red dot without ever having to remove it. Now, is it needed? Probably not. Probably the red dot would survive anyway, but it's, it's important enough to me, and the cloth is relatively inexpensive. I do it anyway. I wrap up my rifles with red dots just to have them protected in that way. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. That And uh, yeah, the shielding cloth in general is not that expensive. So the next big one um, cause like, uh, what was it? The TV show Jericho. And then it's been in, in almost every other book, airplanes just fall out of the sky. And we kind of spoke to this a second ago, but can you really go in and, and talk to us more about, you know, what, what's going to happen to airplanes or wh- what, what are the likely outcomes I should say? Yeah. So I did some research in this and it is it's interesting to note that uh, at least based on which reports you read, when the, the bombs were dropped over Japan back in the 40s, the airplanes in the sky nearby were damaged. Some of them were damaged, Hmm. which is interesting because, again, whenever you detonate a bomb, you generate an EMP, right? And Mm -hmm. so the bomb that the vehicles that actually dropped the bomb, at least according to some reports, experienced some electrical damage from that. And so it's certainly possible that, I mean, it's, you know, uh, an airplane is a collection of electromechanical devices all put together. Um, So it's certainly possible they could suffer some form of damage. On the positive side, though, they're really designed 
hardcore to be tough. I mean, they can take direct lightning strikes. I know that from experience. <laughs> um, and they have all kinds of electromagnetic, you know, CMEs hit the earth while they're in the sky and they don't fall out, you know, um, solar flares hit the earth and they, you know, while they might experience anomalies on occasion, they, you don't hear about them falling out of the sky from that. So the point being is they're well shielded. They typically are quad redundant, meaning that there's four redundant systems on board. So that if you lose one flight computer, oftentimes there are others in backup that can be switched in and so forth. And so is it possible to take out airplanes? Yes. Is it likely? I don't think so. Um, I think likely what would happen is all the planes in the vicinity would experience something, some kind of anomaly, gauges, other things doing wrong, and they would be forced to land very quickly. And so you'd have thousands, potentially thousands of airplanes seeking a place to land very quickly so they could assess their, their respective damage. Now, the bigger issue might be that the, the, the support systems on the ground might become inoperable including, you know, radio traffic. And so there's all these backup methods, including people waving people in and all kinds of things that could be done to land airplanes. Could you do that for a thousand airplanes all at one time? I think it would really tax our system. Um, and in the, in the, my guess is if something were to happen, you would probably have some airplanes that, that might crash as they tried to do these emergency landings. But I don't know if you'd have any that literally, you know, lost all power in flight and fell to the earth. I don't know that you would, and I don't know that you wouldn't. Okay. What about batteries? And and we'll start with the average alkaline batteries that most people have. Yeah, so batteries in general are electrochemical. They in general they don't have susceptibility to an electromagnetic EMP and the only exception to that are batteries that have inherent circuitry in them. Like for example, your laptop batteries. Some of these batteries the uh, you know, smart batteries that decide how much charge to allow in and all that kind of stuff. Like the the high end eighteen six fifties that go in some some of the flashlights now and stuff like that. Yeah, if you have smarts in the battery system, then that potentially is just like anything else, you could damage it um and it could not work properly at that point. But the actual battery cells and the way they're made like car batteries and things like that, they're not gonna be damaged themselves by an EMP. Now I will say that if they're connected to a hard line, anything that's plugged in to a grid or any kind of electrical lines like that, you're going to get a conductive pulse of energy that could flow into them that can cause all kinds of damage to things. But just freestanding batteries, you know, sitting in your kitchen drawer, they're not going to be affected by the EMP. Okay. What about, we'll, we'll just say home systems as a general category and lump in solar, water pumps, septic systems, stuff like that. Yeah. So Again, if they're connected to the grid, and, and most of them are, um, you know, even if you have a backup system, your normal daily connection is probably to the grid, then you have that, that very real risk of that incident conducted pulse. This is not one coming through the air. This is one that got onto the power line and it's being brought in through a wire into your house. And you know, that energy could be very significant and it could damage motors, it could damage your, you know, your refrigerator, your televisions, whatever are plugged into that. Um, imagine the kind of thing that happens when lightning strikes sometimes nearby, you'll get a large pulse and it might blow out your computer, right? You know, they'll say, oh, you had some kind of a surge at your house and, and that's what caused your damage. Well, this would be that, but much more significant and over a much broader area. So you could certainly cause damage, um, for things that were plugged in. Okay. And I guess as one more thing that the question of will it impact it? What about implanted medical devices such as pacemakers, insulin pumps? Um, I, I don't, I'm sure there's other implanted devices that help people live. I don't know what they are, um, but would an EMP impact those? Like is somebody with a pacemaker just going to go punk and fall right over? Yeah. You know, I wondered about this. I guess it was about a year ago. I, I had that question asked of me. And my first thought is, I doubt they'll die um, because it's a very small device. It's implanted in the body um, and its size being small enough that only the really high frequency energy is going to couple well into it. But it's not something I know definitively, but I did reach out to a couple of people, including someone who had looked at the susceptibility of pacemakers to electromagnetic interference, which an EMP is a type of electromagnetic interference. Mm -hmm. And what they told me was that, um, Modern bi uh, pacemakers are called bipolar pacemakers, and they were designed to be much less susceptible than older pacemakers. And so the experts, uh, at least prediction to me was that they, they thought they could survive, you know, maybe a thousand volts per meter 
felt actually at the pacemaker of the right frequency. And so my guess is that you might have some pacemakers that, that shut off and then were able to be, rest- be restarted. I think they re- have to restart them by a doctor, but I'm not, I'm not a pacemaker expert. I don't mm-hmm. think a person just you know, can thump their, thump their body and have it restart <laughs> or anything, but, uh-huh. but I suspect it might would survive it. And the pacemaker, as long as the person wasn't so dependent on it, you know, that they died immediately with it cutting off, they would likely still survive. That was what the expert suggested to me. It's not to say there wouldn't be people who died because their pacemaker shut off because, you know, the doctors are going to be, you can imagine the chaos and Mm -hmm. you're not going to rise to the top of the list um, because there's going to be so many other problems going on. And so, but it's hard for me to say definitively whether or not those devices would, you know, for sure malfunction or not. They are susceptible because they're solid state electronics, but they're also embedded and they're also very small. So I think it's, and they're designed to take very high voltages. So I think it's an iffy thing. I'm not certain. Okay. It's sounding more and more to me like the thing that is really under the biggest threat that, that is a real, uh, a real thing is that EMP man-made or otherwise the thing that it's going to hurt the most is going to be the electrical grid, which causes all of its own problems, but it's not. It's not like everything else is just going to stop. Right. I think that's fair to say. I think there'll be, there'll be lots of, of small things. That, there'll be some cars that crash and there'll be you know, emergency landings of airplanes and all kinds of things like that that, that cause chaos beyond what we would imagine. Mm-hmm. But, but there will be, will be things that can be managed to some degree or not. The, the problem with the electrical grid is that it is sort of the lifeblood of our society, right? And yeah. so everything feeds off the grid, emergency services, government. I mean, you can just go down the list in water purification, food distribution, everything goes off of the grid, petroleum processing. If the grid goes down for any period of time, m- more than hours, it starts to impact these other infrastructures. And if it's down for any appreciable period of time, let's say weeks or months, you really will be in an apocalyptic type scenario very quickly with people not having food and not having water and, and people dying. And so it's, it's the sort of the lifeblood that if you lose it, everything quickly falls after it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is, and I saw this on doomsday preppers and I've seen this question posed a lot in forums and, and, and I'm, I'm setting this up a little bit because you also have a, a YouTube video about it. Uh, does the, the galvanized cash trash can that you go down to home Depot or Lowe's or wherever and pick up, uh, can you put your electronics or grandmother with her pacemaker in a galvanized trash can <laughs> and, and protect them? Yeah. So to answer that, I'll, I'll give you a couple of data points. So one is um, a good Faraday cage or a good conductive enclosure. Um, it provides about 50 dB of shielding or greater. Now, what does that mean? It means it reduces the seals by about a factor of 300. Okay. So if you had a field that was 300 volts per meter, it would reduce it down to about one volt per meter. So that's pretty darn good, right? Mm. 99.7% reduction or something. That, that sounds pretty darn good. Now, people will argue with me and say, no, no, you need more than that. You need 80 dB, which is 99.99%. Okay, we can argue all day about what the right level is, but I believe 50 dB is, is enough. Anything in a 50 dB shielded box will very likely survive. So that's the first me- metric is to say, if if I can get 50 I'll probably, anything in there will probably survive. Okay. Um, a, a galvanized can, and I've tested many different ways, many different cans and, and galvanized garbage cans and, and fire safes and ammo cans and, you know, all kinds of things. Um, certainly a galvanized can can provide that level if it's properly sealed around the lid. All right. And I mentioned that earlier to you is that it's that long, narrow seam that can leak the energy in. And it's an interesting experiment. If you just take a regular garbage can like that, you put your stuff, that can measure the field levels inside and you put the lid on. If the lid is not like super snug all the way around, making metal contact all the way around, you can get as little as 10 dB of shielding inside that can, which is not very much at all. If you just run a a strip of tape around that same can, around the lid on the outside, that can go up to 50 in the blink of an eye. So for, you know, 20 cents of tape, you can improve it significantly. Um, and so I really tell people, you know, it's all about the seam. And so there's two ways to do it. One is that go get you some aluminum tape and tape around the outside. That's fine. The other is to put a, a, a little metal gasket on the inside of the lid. And I have a picture on my website, uh, disasterprepper.com that shows where you put that gasket. You can order them there or you can find your own, but they're these little metal gaskets that you put on the inside of the lid 
And then when you put the lid on, it actually makes contact with the top of the can. And so it creates a very nice feel um, and actually can give you more like 70 dB of protection, which is fantastic. Hmm. So anyway, so those cans can work great if you, if you do them right. And another interesting experiment is to get a well-sealed can and then say, okay, I've got, let's say, 50 dB of shielding in it, and then take a drill and drill a quarter-inch hole in the side and ask somebody, what do you think is going to happen? Is it going to really make it terrible now, or is it not going to make any difference? And the answer is, it doesn't make any difference, hardly at all. And the reason is, is it's not a long, narrow slot. It's a hole, and one hole by itself doesn't leak a lot of energy. And so it's a really interesting experiment. You can drill like, let's say, a hole here and there around this can, and the energy that you see inside does not go up by very much at all. Hmm. So, But if you take a knife and you cut a narrow slot in it, let's say a two-inch narrow slot, the energy will jump significantly. And so anyway, people get real worried about like the, the tiny holes around the rivets. They're like, oh, there's a, I see there's a tiny hole around the rivets. I'm like, don't worry about the tiny holes. Worry about the long slot. And so that's my message I'll leave everybody with if you're going to build a can. Huh. That's really interesting. And I think that also kind of brings up like the topic of shielding and what are products people can actually buy uh, that are good products and where can they buy them to, to actually protect their, their stuff. If you're going to build your own Faraday cage, you can start with any kind of a box, like let's say a wooden box or even a cardboard box. And you can wrap it up real good in foil and tape it down with regular tape, and, and that will work fine. The only hassle of that is every time you want to get in it, you know, you got to rip it all up, right? Because uh, you've taped it up so well, you can't, foil doesn't last very long when you try and take it back apart. Mm. So it's kind of a hassle, but it can be done. It's very cheap, doesn't cost you really anything. And so if money is short, that's a good way to do it. Um, another way is to build your own ad hoc cage, which is like a galvanized garbage can, is a good one. You go spend, you know, $25 and buy you a can and a roll of tape. You put your stuff inside. A lot of people line the inside of the can with like cardboard or something. So nothing shorts against the inside walls. That's fine. Um, you don't really need it a lot of times because electronics are typically already housed in plastic, you know, containers, but that's okay. If you want to line it with the inside, that's fine. And then just tape it up and that will work well. Again, it's a little bit of a pain because pulling off that tape, and I've done it many times, can tear up your fingers and slice you. And it's just a bit of a I have a lot of blood down in my lab that I've laughed over the years. But, um, and so maybe a better way is to spend, I think I sell these gaskets on my website. I think they're like 30 bucks or something. And you can put these little conductive gaskets on the lid and then you can just take the lid on and off just like normal. You don't ever have to tape it. Um, so, you know, you're maybe total out of pocket, 50, 60 bucks, and you've got a, a, a large Faraday cage. Um, so in terms of, of Faraday cages, those are pretty good ways of doing it. If you have a very large thing, like let's say a generator, Lots of people are worried about their generators getting fried or their solar uh, generation system. Maybe it's a backup one that they keep in the garage. They don't use it normally, but they, you know, I'm going to wheel it out if I need it. And to do those, they're so big, it's very hard to build an enclosure for them. I recommend that you use conductive cloth. And, and basically all that is, is it's cloth that they've sewn metal fibers into it, interweave these metal fibers. And I tested about 25 different cloths in my lab to find the one that I thought did the best and was reasonably priced and all that kind of stuff. And I sell one on disasterprepper.com by the linear foot, it's like five feet wide by however many feet long you want it. And so you can buy that cloth from me or from anybody else. And then you can just drape it over. Let's say you have a generator sitting in the garage. You can drape it over your generator and let it come into contact with the concrete floor. Okay. Uh, and you get pretty good shielding. It's enough. It's maybe about 20 to 30 dB. It's, it's enough to protect, protect, you know, a sort of rug, rugged generator electronics that are in there. So that's another option to use conductive cloth. Um, the third thing I would say is that if you have something plugged into the wall and you just, you just can't afford not to have it plugged in, you can put what's called a ferrite around the power cord. And it, it really is just, a, you can imagine a little black piece of plastic that you just clip around your power cord. You can take it on or off anytime you want without having to unplug the thing. And all it does is it acts as a suppression device. If a transient comes in on the power line, that ferrite sort of acts as a resistance to that transient and tries to suppress it. Now, it's not a guarantee that anything post after the ferrite will survive, but it will certainly affect the transient that everything sees. It will reduce it some. Um, and let's say it reduced it by a factor of 10. So if you had a, you know, a 500 volt pulse come in the house, now it's a 50 volt pulse and many things might survive that. And so the idea is to try and 
reduce that incident energy using ferrites. And again, I have those on my website, disasterprepper.com, but you can also find those around the web if you search ferrites. Um, the key is to find one that has broadband protection for an EMP. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I actually use ferrites on all my microphone cables and everything else because at one point I was uh, evidently near some someone's pri- uh, pirate radio station and it was in particular messing with my headphones. And so I would sit down and do a recording and I was listening to uh, <clears throat> really awful Tejano music the entire time, which is very distracting. Um, but anyway, yeah, ferrite beads are, are pretty cool and really easy to use. So, you know, one of the questions I had for you, uh, cause I was curious about this cause I was actually looking at your cloth. So yours, you made a, a point out of it being stainless steel. Why that, that was the, the metal fiber. Why not? Um, cause I know a lo- I, I saw that a lot of other ones were, uh, like a, a nickel and copper mm-hmm. blend or something. Yeah. Yeah. There are, there's, there's basically three kinds that you'll find. There's, there's nick, nickel and copper mixes. There's uh, stainless steel and there's silver. Um, they all work. Um, what I did is like I said, I bought 25 different samples mm-hmm. and I, cause I wanted to have the full spectrum was all out here, you know, and before I recommend one. And what I found was the silver ones are the softest. Like if you were going to wear a shirt and, and people do, they bought, you know, made shirts out of this stuff because they have, let's say a pacemaker or they feel like they're very susceptible to EMI. You would buy a silver one because it's nice and soft. feels like a soft t-shirt. Hmm. Um, but silver tends to tarnish. You couldn't, you know, the material couldn't be washed. It, you know, it lost its effectiveness. It was washed. And so it wasn't really that kind of rugged, you know, throw over my car or throw over my generator kind of thing. It was more like a, you know, wear as a shirt kind of thing. Okay. The ones that were nickel and the copper had a, um, um, a fibery, uh, prickly feel to them, an uncomfortable feel that I didn't like. And I know a lot of people have nickel allergies um, yeah, do, and don't want to have nickel all the time, uh-huh. uh, you know, be in contact with it. Now, as people have pointed out, Hey, stainless steel has nickel in it. It is true, but not to the level that these claws that were like 20% nickel have. Um, and so when I looked at those, um, I, I ultimately decided, well, stainless steel is not going to rust on me. I'm not going to have discoloration over time. It was washable. The cost was uh, much better than many of, let's say the silver cloth. So I ended up migrating down to two. I found two claws that met my goals and I built full size car covers out of both of them, <laughs> and, which was ex- very expensive. Uh. But I wanted to know for myself, for real, which one of these guys is better. And I tested both full size over my car and did all the measurements and then picked the one that did the best. And that's the one I resell. Okay. And is it something that like, I guess, could you just like the generator, like maybe you could put stuff in a gun safe and then drape like make a cover for your gun safe and drape it over as long as it's touching, touching the ground. Yeah. People do that. In fact, um, now it is, there's, there are many ways to shield and this is a little bit confusing to people, but the one we've talked about is to build a fully, a full enclosure, right? And that's called a Faraday cage where everything is sealed up tight. It does the best. Okay. But even if you just have, let's say, and you know this from being in radio, if you have a radio antenna, and you put a large conductor in front of it and sort of wrap it around the antenna, but leave the backside open, the signal that you receive or transmit will be greatly reduced because you've blocked part of it with that, that conductive um, piece in front of it. Hmm. And so people, what they do is they know their gun safe is this big, heavy-duty metal thing, but it has this seam around the door. And it also has, nowadays, they make these really cheap digital locks on these gun safes, right? Mm -hmm. And so they're worried that, oh crap, my digital lock's going to go out and I can't get in my gun safe. And so they'll buy a piece of this conductive cloth and they'll, they'll lay it up on the top and drape it down in front of the gun safe and the the face of the gun safe. And indeed it does reduce the fields that would be able to get into that crack around the door and come into the gun safe. Um, It doesn't do as well as a Faraday cage, but it does better than nothing um, I even had one guy sew a little hat-like structure that goes right over his lock. It's like, it looks just like a hat, like a round hat that you mm. put on. He just sticks it over. And again, it's not grounded. It's not connected to the earth ground. But even being a piece of metal will attenuate RF energy as the energy tries to propagate through the metal. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, I don't think you'd want to tape up you know, the face of your gun safe because then you could never get in and out of it. Right. I mean, I'm in and out of mine a lot. Um, and so I like the idea of having like a curtain that you drape down in front of the front of it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, again, it's not a perfect solution, but it doesn't have to be perfect because everything inside of there is unpowered anyway. Right. Mm-hmm. 
And so my idea is I'll put my, I could put my small scale electronics in there. Now there's one thing you can do that will greatly improve the chances of anything surviving. And that is to put it first inside of what we, what I call an EMP bag, but they're really anti-static bags. And they're these metalized plastic bags. They come in all different sizes. I sell them as big as three feet by two feet, but you can put your electronics in them, fold them up, tape them, and it provides by itself about 50 dB of shielding. So even with no other steps, everything inside those bags is almost certain to survive. But oh, you okay. could, for example, if you had things you were going to put in your gun safe that you, you know, spare phones or, or whatever you're putting in there, you could put them in these little bags and fold them over and tape them up and then put them in your gun safe. And you wouldn't even have to worry about taping up the seams of the safe um, because they're already well protected inside those bags. I gotcha. Okay. Well, very cool. So. Dr. Bradley, somebody's listening to this episode. They're like, I get this guy. It fine. Like I'm finally starting to make sense of this stuff. How do they connect with you? Where do they go? Yeah, the easiest way to connect with me is just go to my website. It's disasterprepper.com. You can search. I have lots of books out on various subjects, including EMP preparedness. And you can search for those on all the book retailers like Amazon. Very cool. And what was your website address one more time? It's disasterprepper.com. Dr. Bradley, thank you so much for joining us today and setting us straight on so many of the wild world that is EMPs. All right. Thanks for having me. Show notes, links to Dr. Bradley and other resources from this episode can be found by going to in the rabbit hole.com slash E two five one support the show and get I to rage roving horde armada members only benefits. Go to I to to become part of the roving horde armada twice a month members get access to private virtual hangs these are a chance to hang out with me and other like-minded everyday preppers and discuss whatever's on your mind the things you just can't talk about with anybody else get big discounts to the igh gear shop and participating vendors you also get access to every episode ever produced by igh the on-demand bug out bag class special prepper spreadsheets and an invitation to the super secret Slack group. And that's just to name a few things you get when you go to iturage.net to become part of the Roving Horde Armada. Again, that's iturage.net to find out about the exclusive members only benefits. With that, we wrap up episode number 251 from the Lone Star State. Till next time, stay safe and sound. Western.